Hello YouTube. Right, I think I've got it working, sort of. That doesn't look like the right resolution, but I don't want to tinker with it, so just... We'll leave it as is. So I'm going to let people drop in, um, and then we'll, we'll crack on. What this is going to be... Oh, that's my door sneaking open. That is a ghost. Hang on. Could be my dog. There we go. Um, yeah, Sally, yeah, that is uh, the resolution, which um, I don't want to tinker with it at this point because I don't want to cock it up. So hopefully, um, yeah, that's a little bit annoying, but we'll hopefully be all right. Um, so what is, uh, what is, what am I going to be talking about? I'm going to go a little bit through my camera gear. Uh, ca the cameras that I've owned, the camera gear that I'm using at the moment, I'm going to talk about the lenses. Um, it's also a little bit about some of the extra gear that I've had uh, in in the past and just talk some different stuff so this is my first live thing that I've done online I've done done live TV ironically enough but I've not really done live stuff online so we'll see how it goes hopefully we don't cock up too much um, now I think I should probably start with the cameras I was uh, starting off on I, I used a, a Canon camera to start with, it was a 400D off the top of my head. Uh, I should also just say, full disclosure, I'm not really a, a technical photographer. I'm a naturalist with a camera. I'm not really a wildlife photographer. So if you've got any really technical questions, uh, I might not know it, but I'll, I'll answer what I can. And that's a point about questions as well. Um, I mean, I'm gonna wait till the end if there's any general, you might wanna ask me about the, the underwater stuff that I do, the fish and all that kind of thing. That's great, we'll do a Q and A at the end for that. But if you want to ask anything about the equipment while we're talking about it, then just comment below and I'll I'll answer them as we go along because that's going to be more be more relevant. Um, but sorry, I'm a bit gassy because I'm drinking uh, drinking cider, so I'll try not to belch too much while we're while I'm doing a live video because that wouldn't be great. Um, I started off on Canon. Uh, I use a Canon 400D, as I said, and there's this huge debate with photographers Canon v Nikon, and it gets silly. It really, really gets silly. And it's sort of like, well, the way I see it is it's the best camera is the one you've got in your hand, you know. And if you, I, I challenge any photographer to have, if you put a really good image from a Canon and a really good image from a Nikon and you get someone who could tell them apart, I don't think it's possible, you know. It seems to be, when, when I notice, and this is me as a professional saying this, when you get people who look um, at Canon and Nikon, it's always nitpicky things. I mean, it, it might very well be that there are, um, little things that you prefer to go for with those cameras but at the end of the day it's just whatever you're brought up on. So I started with Canon, I then went to University in Falmouth and all their gear was Nikon. So it made sense to switch to Nikon because I wanted to use all the camera gear. They had millions of pounds worth of camera gear and I wanted to use that. So I bought a Nikon D7000 uh, which, which I gave away, gave away to my father-in-law or my future father-in-law anyway and then uh, eventually I bought a D500, which is this camera. Just take a quick swig. Um, so the D500, I mean, it's not really that new a camera anymore, uh, but it, it's pretty decent. It's crop sensor, so full frame is equivalent to 35mm. This is slightly cropped, uh, and it does the job. I mean, and the, the thing with camera bodies, what's amazing is how quickly... They go out of date. And this is one bit of advice I'd give you. If you're going to spend money, spend money on lenses. Spend money on the glass. Don't spend it uh, on the cameras. I mean, if you've got the money, spend it on the cameras. But uh, a camera body will go out of date within three or four years. And that's uh, that's what I try and do. Every three or four years, I buy a new uh, camera. Because otherwise, they're just left in the dust. And as I say, I got this probably three or four years ago. And when I first got it, it was a cracking camera. It's not bad now, but there are already cameras far better than, than the D500. So... For stills photography, this is predominantly what I'm using. For you know, 99% of the stills images that I take are done with a a D500. It's not a it's not a bad camera by by any means. Um, 
So would when you know one of the things I get asked is, uh, what camera should I start off? I'm, I want to be a wildlife photographer. I want to get into wildlife photography. What camera should I get? Honestly, it's whatever camera you can afford, whatever camera you can get. It's not really a case of this is the Pacific brand, Pacific specific brand. Uh, you know, there is no camera that I would say that's the one you should start off. It's just whatever you can afford, play around with it, and then you can obviously start spending more money as you go along. So. Uh, I mean, a D500 isn't even really classed as professional. I think it's semi-professional. Uh, but it does the job for me, and I really like it. And what you'll probably see for a lot of my gear, uh, apart from the underwater stuff, is it's all second-hand uh, or, or, not, or, or budget, really. So even though I'm professional, I still don't spend huge amounts of money, I say, except on the underwater side. So D500 is the, uh, the Nikon camera that I use predominantly. There are lots of other cameras out there, obviously, uh, but that's the one I, I particularly use. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about mirrorless later on because I do think that's the future for wildlife photography. And I have got a mirrorless camera, which I'll show you. Um, but mirrorless is just absolutely um, incredible. But one of the things I would also say with uh, with photographers and cameras is like you wouldn't ask a painter what paintbrush he uses. So why is it that whenever someone sees a fantastic photo, they always say, what camera did you use? It's got, the camera's something to do with it, but it's the photographer at the end of the day. The photographer takes the picture, not the camera. And I think people forget that. So that's what I would uh, always say. Like, don't get hung up on the camera too much. Unless you've got really specific needs, you know, just get out there, shoot. You'll find out what you need and you can find those qualities in uh, in the particular camera. You know, the, the best camera is the one in your hand. That's that's the way I see it, basically, for uh, for a lot of these so that's what I'm using predominantly for stills now uh, many of you will probably see some of the underwater work that I do particularly of, of freshwater fish and I use my D500, D500 for the stills on that but for the video I use uh, a lot of uh, other kinds of stuff so I use for example these action cameras and I've got a few different ones to show you um, okay what's Sally saying do do you use your land cameras underwater or do you have specific underwater cameras um, so yeah, so the D500, uh, I've got housing for, which I'll show in a second. So I do use that underwater. Um, and then I've also got these action cameras, uh, these kind of, you know, GoPro type things. And I'll use them predominantly underwater, but I also use those on land for, you know. But recently, in lock under lockdown, I've been using them for birds in my garden. So probably the most uh, well-known action camera is the GoPro. Everyone knows what GoPros are. They're really, really popular. I'm going to put my phone on silent as well because I know someone will try ringing me. Um, so GoPros are really really popular. Um, what I would say with action cameras is it's completely down to again your needs and your budget. So there are better cameras than GoPro, better action cameras, but you're looking at 800 quid. I think there's the Sony, I can't remember the name of it, but Sony have an action camera and it's about 800 pounds. Now it is the dogs, it's fantastic, but do you want to spend 800 quid on an action camera? Whereas there are cameras which are much cheaper than GoPros, you know, potato quality footage, but they're only about 40 quid. So I would suggest get the cheap one, get the get the potato camera. And then if you think, you know what, I like this, but I need better quality, then move up to something else. And GoPro have cornered the market so much with this. I sound like a GoPro salesman. I'm not sponsored or anything by them, but I, I really, really like them. This is the Hero 7. I think they've gone up to the Hero 8 now. Uh, but they're really good. They're not even uh, specifically designed for underwater. They're designed more for sports, you know, people putting them on their head and, and stuff like that. But I really like them. They're really good for underwater video. Uh, I've got eight action cameras. So that's another way how I get so much footage because I've got eight cameras out all at once. Um, so GoPros are fantastic. That's what I would recommend. That's a good start. But I do use other action cameras. There are other ones out there. So, for example, Nikon brought one out. And this is the Nikon Key Mission 170. So Nikon tried to kind of get into that action camera market and it's a bit cheaper than a GoPro. I think it's around about the 200 quid mark, something like that. So half the price of what you'd pay for a GoPro. And it's not bad. It's all right, actually. It's, it's not, a, not a bad camera. It's, it's nowhere near the, the, the Hero 7, but it's well worth investing in. You know, they all shoot 1080, but at least some of them shoot 4K. Um, and I really like it. I can't fault it. I think Nikon have actually discontinued them. So you might be able to pick them up even cheaper, but uh, the Nikon Key Mission 170 is pretty good. And then you can even go cheaper. Now this is the uh, the Yi, the Y the what Y I Yi, and uh, it's all right. It's a kind of a Chinese knockoff if you want to be cynical of a GoPro, but it's got a housing 
So these two can just go in the water like that. They can just go in, no housing needed, off you go. With this one, take that camera out, and it's like a housing there. Um, it's relatively simple controls, but I think you can get these for around about the 100 quid mark. So, you know, it's a good starting place. And the quality is not bad on the E. I, I use this still, um, and it's not too bad. So they're sort of the action cameras that I'm using anyway, predominantly for underwater mostly, but you can use them for land as well. There's no reason why. Um, one thing I will say is for stills, they're not great. The GoPro's okay. It's not bad on stills, but if you want to take stills, I wouldn't buy a GoPro um, just for that. But they can take okay stills on that. The other two, not, not so great. So if I move then to mirrorless. So this is my uh, latest acquisition. And this is a Panasonic Lumix uh, GH5S. So I've uh, been wanting one of these for ages. Mainly because it's more video than it is stills. And that's where my work's gone. So over the years I started off as a stills photographer. And now I've largely gone into videography. So I've been filming for, you know, different TV programs. So weirdly, I'm on Springwatch tonight. Well, I'm not. My footage is some minnows on Springwatch tonight. Um, so I can't be longer than 8 o'clock, so I want to watch that. Uh, but the minimum requirement for a camera for a lot of these TV productions is this. This is what they're using. So I knew I wanted to get one. Um, and I must admit, I'm really, really impressed with it. Stills are not uh, spectacular on it. They're not bad, though, to be fair. To say it's not a dedicated stills camera, it's okay. But it's all right for, for what it is. It's not a bad little uh, camera in that respect. Shoots 4K, like 10-bit 4K, which is you know really, really good for, for the TV stuff. Um, however, I couldn't afford the lenses for it. So I got the, the Lumix, the Panasonic Lumix, but I didn't have any lenses for it. So as a kind of short-term thing, I got one of these, which is a Metabones adapter. So what that means is I can put that onto the, the Panasonic Lumix, and then I can attach all my Nikon lenses. So it meant that I didn't have to buy all new lenses straight away. I could use the pre-existing lenses that I've got, uh, and I could get shooting. I can't do that in auto, I have to be all manual, but it means that I can at least shoot, so that's kind of saved me. Um, there's loads of different ones out there. I mean, again, Metabones is the one I use. It's also a speed booster, so you get an extra stop of light, so it means that it's a little bit easier in that respect. Um, but I'd recommend Metabones, it's pretty good. I'm, I'm quite happy with that. Um, there's a few different out there that you can use and and there's, there's these kind of adapters for everything so say if you had a Canon camera you could get an adapter to put a Nikon lens on it and things like that um, I mean you're better off using native glass if you can but if you haven't got an option or you can't afford it then it's something to uh, to look into so they're the cameras that I'm using at the moment um, I'm sure I will get some more at some point and I'll also just take this opportunity to just say if you haven't already uh, Give me a subscribe on the, to the YouTube channel. It always helps the channel out. It's always great if you can help out in that respect. Um, and also, I have a podcast called the Bearded Tits Podcast, if anyone's checked that out. I don't know if anyone listening to this has listened to any of my podcasts, which I've started up recently. So um, that you know, give that a check out as well if, you, uh, if you're interested in that kind of stuff. But yeah, give the channel a subscribe because that helps me out. Uh, and check out the podcast. So let's talk about lenses. Let's go through some of my lenses that we've... Uh, that I've got. Also, apologise if you can hear hear a hissing. It is absolutely boiling in this room, so my laptop's making a little bit of, uh, of noise there. I've tried to put some ice blocks uh, underneath my laptop to cool that down, but hopefully it'll be uh, it'll be all right. So let's go through my lenses. I might as well start with the lens that's actually on the camera. This is a 50 mm uh, Nikkor lens. Now these are cheap as chips. You can get these for around about. Um, 50, 50 quid, something like that. So they're, um, I don't know, probably a bit more than 50 quid, like 70 to 100, something like that. But I really like them. They're, they're a good lens. It's mainly for portraits, um, if I'm honest. It's more of a portrait lens. But you can use it for wildlife. Um, you have to get relatively close. The advantage of the 50mm is that you can go down to like 1.8, so real, real big aperture there. Let's in lots of lights, lovely soft background. Um, so this is a kind of cheap and cheerful lens, nifty fifty. A lot of photographers call it. I tend to use this for uh, interviews and things like that. But it's a cracking lens, so I definitely recommend uh, the Nikon uh, fifty mm lens. But again, like Canon will have a version. Um, 
Sony will have a version. They all got kind of similar versions to that. So that's the first one. That's pr this is probably the lens I use the least as well. I should say I don't really use it that much, but uh, for what for what you pay for it, it's not a bad bad little lens. Um, for macro, I actually only own seven lenses. I've just realised this, so I don't own loads of. People would think again because I'm you know professional. I own loads of lenses. I don't seven. Um, for macro, I use the Takina. 100mm 2.8 uh, and again people get a little bit hung up sometimes on if I've got a Nikon camera I have to use um, you know a Nikon lens don't necessarily have to you know you can you can use these other ones and Tekina are a brilliant brand I use a couple of Tekina lenses um, you show oh, sorry someone's just a uh, message you uh, you showed your new web a uh, wild cam camouflage colors does it shoot after the movement or um, continually wild cam Oh, is that a, um, oh, uh, what you call it, sorry, the trail cam, like the trail cam. Yeah, so I did buy a trail cam. The reason I'm not including that in today is because it's actually out by a river now. I'm trying to film otters with it. So that was a browning trail cam, um, which I can't, yeah, I've not included that today because I haven't got it with me. But that's really good. Browning are a pretty, yeah, there we go. Yep, yep, no worries. Um, so, yeah, that's a really good trail cam. Um, and it, it goes by um, movement when the animal goes by. So hopefully I'll be posting some otters from that um, in a week or so. I'm leaving it out for a week. If it's still there, it's in a relatively kind of busy spot, but it should be there. Uh, back to this lens anyway. So this is the Takina 100mm macro. Uh, again, for what it is, relatively cheap. I, I, I mean, I bought it years ago. I think it cost me about 300 something like that. Cracking lens though. Really, really like that. It's a good lens. Um, and that's what I use for 90% of the macro images that you'll see. Uh, uh, with this so yeah recommend Takina on that the other Takina lens that I use and this is, you'll notice a lot of my photography is done with this is the fisheye uh, 10 to 17 now this is kind of the the holy grail for underwater photographers um, nearly um, not nearly all but a lot of underwater photographers use this lens and this is because uh, you've got that function of zooming in and out you know 10 the 10 ends very wide so you can fit everything in 17 you can crop in a little bit it's pin sharp it's a really really sharp lens you can focus pretty much up to the glass like that. You know, it's bonkers. So you can get really, really close to the subject. And I like to do land subjects with this as well. You know, if I've got a, you know, something like a butterfly uh, or a frog, if it'll allow you to get that close, you can get some really funky images with this lens. Again, around about 400 quid. They are a bit flimsy. I mean, this is falling to pieces now. I'm basically, once it becomes unusable, I'll have to buy another one. But I would highly recommend a Takina 10-17mm. It is a, a really, really good... Uh, good lens in that respect so yeah underwater photographers use this quite a bit uh someone asked uh is it i think you mean the trail cam is that underwater no uh, there are no underwater trail cams because infrared doesn't work underwater so it doesn't work like that um for the stuff that i do it's just cameras running continuously and then i have to pick out the, the good bits sally's put how many lenses fit with your underwater housing so i this is the main one that i use uh with my underwater housing i've also got the macro which i use with that but each, each lens uh, has to be done with a different port, so it can get quite costly, so um, that's why I've only got a, a couple. But in theory, uh, apart from long lenses, you can use uh, wide-angle macro underwater, and you just get the relative port to that. But I'll talk a little bit more about that when I show, when I show the housing off in a second. Uh, but that's a Takina anyway, the, the, the fisheye, really good lens, I quite, quite recommend that. Uh, the kit lens, which is probably the most underrated lens for any photographer, so this is just a Nikon uh, 18 to 55 mil kit lens, and I use it quite a lot. I, I, you know, it's the lens I got with my camera. I still use it loads now. Uh, it's pretty decent. You know, it's a general lens. It's not really designed for anything in particular, but can do a lot of things. You know, sometimes I use it for close-up macro stuff. Not dead close-up, but relatively close-up. Uh, you can use it for landscape. So don't underestimate your kit lens. They're cheap. They're cheerful, but they do the job. So if you haven't got a kit lens, you definitely should have one. And I use this a hell of a lot when I'm filming, but also to get more kind of scenic shots. So kit lenses, don't uh, don't underuse them. And then long lenses, and I guess people thinking that I'm a wildlife photographer, that I've got lots of long lenses and they do uh, cost quite a bit. Sorry, I'm trying to swig my cider um, stealthily. Um, the first long lens that I got was this, which is a 70 to 300 mil. And it's not bad, it's okay. It, it, it's relatively, you know, on the budget end, as I say again, uh, but it's a great one to start out. So if you're thinking about doing bird photography or, or stuff like that and you want to try 
um, you know, try your hand at it, but you don't want to spend a, a ridiculous amount of money, it's a great one to use. It's also really compact. So, you know, it's obviously not a very big lens. It's not that heavy. It's easy to carry in a rucksack. So I'd recommend it for that kind of stuff. It's a bit soft on the 300 end, which is a bit of a shame. Uh, but for the most part, particularly video, you know, when I'm videoing stuff, it's not bad. It's all right. I use it quite a bit for that kind of stuff. Um, I don't use it as much as I used to, but if you're starting out, it's a good kind of long lens to play around with. Um, and I think Canon and all the others have, have similar versions to these as well. The aperture doesn't go down as, as large as I would have liked. I think 5.6 is about the most on this, but it's okay for what it is. My main large lens, so my main big lens, my proper lens, if you want to call it that, is this, which is a fixed uh, 300mm uh, Nikon lens 2.8. Now, it's quite an old one. Uh, it's God knows how old it is. I got this, so I work at the University of Nottingham as a guest lecturer, and this, this was this, the lens they rented out to students. So it had been it had been mistreated. If this was a this would be the kind of Staffordshire Bull Terrier in the Dogs Trust, looking at you all sad and neglected. This is the lens version of that. Uh, but I, I took it off them for you know a relatively good price, I should say. Doesn't shoot uh, all uh, manual, but it does shoot auto. And despite being a bit heavy, as it's an older lens, it does the job for me. Now, as a as a wildlife photographer, uh, it's very rare that I use anything longer than three hundred just because the practicality of carrying a 600mm around all day, um, it, it would just be ridiculous. So the only time I'd ever use a lens like that is if I'm in a stationary hide with a very skittish subject. Otherwise, 300 is as long as I would normally go, just because I, that's still long enough that I can get to, close to the subject, but I can also carry it around um, and use it like that. So there's a little bit of camo on there and some tape just holding it all together. It looks a bit sad. But it does the job. So, you know, despite being old, despite being heavy, it's a pretty, pretty decent lens in in that respect. Um, if I could afford any lens, if someone said to me, Jack, what money? You know, money is no option. What would you go for? I'd go for the two hundred to four hundred uh, Nikon lens. That is a cracking lens, but I think it's about seven or eight grand or something like that, which I do not have at the moment. So that's what I'd go for if I could, though. So that's my lenses. So I should probably do get to some of the, the underwater stuff because I'm sure that's what a lot of you are, are interested in. So this is my housing. I'll hold this up. So this is what I use for a lot of my underwater work. Uh, I've got the camo tape on that. That is just to, does it make a difference? Probably not. I mean, you know, are the fish that bothered? I think it, it might make a difference. It doesn't hurt to have it on there anyway. Um, now, there are loads of different housings out there. You know, just like there are lots of different camera brands, there are lots of different camera housings. And each camera housing um, corresponds to a specific camera. So, for example, this, this camera housing is for a D500. That's the only camera I can put in this housing. So if I buy a new camera, I have to buy a new housing. So underwater photography can be very, very costly. This is an Icolite housing. And Icolite have got a bit of a reputation for being cheap and nasty. You know what? I've used these for 10 years. I've never had a problem that's not been my fault. I, I really like Icolite, if I'm honest with you. Um, again, I sound like I'm sponsored by them. I'm not. I just think they're, they're not bad. They just look a bit a bit nasty, but they're absolutely fine. Um, so would I recommend Icolite? Yeah. You know, I think they're pretty good. Um, they're, I say it, they're at the cheaper end. I mean, this is probably two grand's worth of kit. When I tally up everything that I've got, underwater you're looking at about three and a half grand's worth of kit now if you go to a different brand and you go for the equivalent you know something like uh, say Nauticam which is seen as the, the kind of the best underwater stuff you could maybe double that so it gets very very expensive uh, I should just say I'm actually getting a Nauticam housing for the GH5 soon um, just because for the video I wanted the best and I looked at what the Nauticam housing offered and it just ticked all the boxes so Nauticam is sort of, you know, if you've got, if money's no no issue, go Nauticam, all day long Nauticam. If you're watching your budget, I can like, but you know, it depends, again, completely depends on your individual needs, so um, that's what I kind of use that. This housing's actually been modified as well, I've, I've had a, an extra port cable put in here, so then a cable can come out of that and I can take pictures uh, from my laptop, so a lot of my underwater photography is remotely done, and that's how I do that, so this is actually a modified housing. Um, don't 
so someone's put don't you get entangled in water plants me personally not really no i mean i i, I kind of swim around in it but no i don't really get caught up in them i'm a pretty good swimmer um so it's not too bad the camera uh, when i do stuff remotely sometimes plants going downstream can get caught up in it that can be a little bit frustrating but for the most part it's not um it's not an issue so as i say that's the housing the housing doesn't change but then each housing has a different port so for the, when the tequina goes on uh, with the camera inside there'd be a small dome port uh, that goes on top of there and then when the macro goes on you'd have a different dome port for that when that goes on so um, it's one of the reasons why underwater photography is largely kind of as a hobby taken by people like dentists and lawyers people who've got uh, spare time and a bit of money because it's not it's not a cheap hobby uh, and it's a difficult profession but you know I wouldn't change it for the world I absolutely love it so um, that is the housing that I am using at the moment now I get asked do I use flash underwater I do and this is what I use with that housing this is called a strobe so it's basically an underwater flash gun and that attaches to the housing and then you've got this mechanical arm and you can just tighten that and adjust it as you need it and then on this on the strobe itself you turn that on there we go you can hear that powering up sounds like a space gun and then you can adjust it you can do TTL so kind of more I'm not a big flash person if I'm honest I don't know huge amounts about it but you can adjust it there and it's relatively easy to do so if I'm going to be scuba diving I'm going deep maybe I want to fill in the colors a little bit more this uh, this baby's the kind of best way to do that so strobes are, are pretty decent for, for that kind of stuff so I'm just going to put that away so I'm just going to go through some of the extra stuff now that I've got I mean I didn't I, didn't, I haven't got every single piece of camera kit that I uh, that I own because you know we'd be here all night but some of the other stuff so for video I've got this mic this is an on-camera mic it is a video a Rode video mic pro um, and I like, I'll record pieces of the camera with this out on location it's pretty decent for that sort of stuff and uh, it's all right. It's not bad. I, I mean, Rode are pretty good for mics. I'd recommend Rode. But this is what we call a directional mic. So as long as it's pointing uh, at the subject, at the person, it'll pick up uh, their audio, but not too much around. And this fluffy thing is what we call a dead cat. And that stops the wind. If you blow on it, then you shouldn't hear it too much. Um, Paul has put, is, is the flash unit the one we use at Pike for Dungeness? Yeah, yeah. So Paul, is he's actually my future father-in-law so yeah we that's the same that's the same setup we did there paul and then um all right and then you've got entangled in the camera and attachments i mean not you as a free diver yeah no uh, no so still the, the camera doesn't get entangled too much it's not too bad really i mean again um if someone's really weedy then i'm probably not going to be photographing in it anyway because it'd be harder to find subjects so so yeah so that's the mic that i'm using for, for the majority of stuff that's pretty pretty good um there is well, kind of two pieces of kit here, actually, but the first one is this little light on top. Now, this is a video uh, light that I use, and they're just called shoot lights, and they're waterproof. So you can go underwater, and let's turn that on, and you can video, basically, uh, subjects underwater with that. So they're about 20 quid on Amazon. They're pretty cheap, you know, so I would uh, I would recommend... Um, recommend that for 20 quid you can't really argue with that so I'll just turn that off and then the thing it's on is like a little tiny tripod and these are called if I get it right a pocket mp3 bk these are really really handy you can put gopros on them I mean they'll actually support a, a camera body um, and again they're not much they're about 20 quid maybe but these are really really handy you know if you're just out and about and you want to take a picture low to the ground uh, or, or maybe you're out on a nature reserve in a hide and you just want to clip it on. They're really, really good piece of kit. They're made by Manfrotto. Um, I love them. I think they're really, really handy. So I've got a few of those. Um, the other thing that I have got is one of these, which is called the Ultimate Lens Hood. And I got this at the photography show last year. Obviously not this year because it was cancelled. But what you do with this is... I don't know if it will fit on this lens. Oh, it will, yeah. So you put the rubber around the lens there we go oh fell off around the lens and then it means that you can put that up against a window uh, or for the what i actually use it for is when i'm photographing in aquariums 
and it stops all the light from the edges getting in. So if any of you have tried to photograph something in an aquarium or you've tried to shoot something through glass and you've got that horrible glare, a polarizer filter might not be working, this is a really good solution. And again, I think it's about 20 quid, something like that. Really easy, it fits in your camera bag. The other thing you can do as well, if it's raining, you can invert it. I'm not showing it very well, but if it's raining, and that gives the camera a little bit of protection from the elements. So there's multiple uses for it, but this was just something someone did on um, Kickstarter, I think it was. And I saw the campaign, I thought, that's really clever. I mean, you know, you could probably make something similar yourself, but it's pretty good. So the last thing, the last thing that I've got to show so I've not gone too in depth today, but I'm just kind of briefly showing you the sort of kit that I use and just uh, showing you that I'm relatively human in the kit that I use. But the last handy thing is this, which is a solar powered uh, battery pack. So it means that if I'm out and about and I need to charge my phone or my GoPros or camera batteries, this is so handy because often I'm in, I'm in the arse end of nowhere. You know, there's no, there's nowhere I can plug in. So I can take a couple of USBs. It all, you can plug two, two cables in there, two USB cables and I can charge everything up while I'm out and about. This is such a handy piece of kit. Uh, there's a few different brands out of there, but again, which is the one? This is a HIS025 solar charger. So, you know, but there's, there's others available. Uh, this is the one I use, pretty decent. So I was pretty, uh, pretty happy with that, and that gets me there. So that actually brings me to the end, more or less, I'm just trying to see if I've forgotten anything, of, of all the kit that I wanted to talk about. So, um, if there are any questions, uh, then then bung them down there and I will answer them. Um, as I said before, if you're not already subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to my channel because it really, really helps that out. So, And if you've not checked out the podcast, as I say, it's the Bearded Tip podcast. I think Matt Lissimore uh, posted about that as well. Yeah, he did. So thanks for that, Matt. Um, I should also just say as well, um, oh, I didn't mention too much about mirrorless as well, but yeah, I, I definitely think that mirrorless... Is, is the way forward with, with photography. Like, uh, to the, the advantage is they're lighter cameras, they're quicker cameras, um, you've got a little bit more zoom on them. I think in the next sort of five, 10 years, you'll see more and more, well, I mean, already, most professional wildlife photographers are using it now, you know, Andy Rouse, David Tipling, uh, so many of them are using mirrorless. So if you're not using a mirrorless camera, it's something to consider, they are absolutely incredible. Uh, and I think the next time I buy a stills camera, it'll definitely be mirrorless. I mean, the, the Panasonic's mirrorless now, but I will definitely get a, uh, a another one there. And my next purchase, if people are interested in, the next big thing I'm going to buy, as I say, is a Nauticam housing for my uh, GH5, because then that means the underwater footage I can get with that will just be uh, will just be really, really nice. It'll be pretty good. So, uh, yeah, Sally's asked what kind of uh, tripod. So, yes, I haven't included a tripod in that. I use a, a Manfrotto head... Um, I can't remember the name of the head off the top of off the top of my head, weirdly enough. And then it's an Optocron tripod. Um, tripods are important. I mean, again, it depends because I do a lot of filming. I've got a video head on mine, so it's a smooth tanning uh, panning rather. I can't remember. That's really bad. I should remember the name of my tripod head. Um, I'll post it later on on Twitter or something just to kind of show if people are interested in that. But um, I got it years ago, so yeah, tripods are obviously really important. But I've not um, I've not really included that. Um, oh, so oh, there you go. You you I just realised you posted too soon. You put oops. Uh, what kind of tripod weights do you use for your GoPros underwater? Sorry, Sally, I was too eager for uh, to answer that question there. Um, so I use I do use these the little pocket thing that I mentioned. So if if the water is um, it's not too fast flowing, then these are pretty, you know, pretty good. You can put a GoPro on that, you can bung that in the water and you get a nice steady shot. You know, GoPros will last roughly for, uh, you know, a couple of hours underwater. So that'll say there, you'll get a nice steady shot. It depends on the flow. If I'm in faster flowing water, then I'll use an old dive weight or a stone or something like that and I'll just uh, fix the GoPro onto that. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, uh, what I do is not particularly complicated, and I think people think that it's easy. It's not easy, but, um, yeah, I don't overcomplicate things normally. I, you know, I've got a few little tricks of the trade, but, um, yeah, it's pretty simple, the stuff that I do. Um, great shirt. Oh, yeah, yeah, I thought I'd better wear a fishy fishy shirt. Um, I think I'm about done, unless there's any more questions. People got some questions, I'll answer them before I go. But as I say, uh, I've got some minnows on Springwatch tonight, so I'm looking forward to watching that. Um 
as I say, sub to the channel if you don't already. Check out my podcast, The Bearded Tips Podcast. I've also got a book coming out in a couple of months, I think, called The Complex Lives of Britain's Fish. So that'll be out soon. Um, and yeah, thanks for joining me. You know, I'm sorry about the, the cock up yesterday with it all. I might do more live shows. I'm not sure. If I, if I can think of something else to talk about live, I've sort of got the hang of it now. I might do another one, but I don't know. If there's an interest, I might do. Uh, maybe not. But look, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate you all tuning in uh, and keep an eye out for more content on the channel every monday and thursday there's new stuff on youtube and hopefully you all enjoyed it so yeah i will catch you next time and uh oh there we go hang on could you make some printed cards with figure names of gear um Yes, I could. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, hope everyone's. I hope everyone has has enjoyed it. And yeah, I'll catch you next time. Cheers.